All right. How's that? Better? OK. Nice. Thank you. I have this tendency where I want to pace around, but maybe I'll have to stand right here. OK. Uh, really, right here. OK. So my name is Caleb. And hi, here's me. Like most of everyone here, probably, I am a Ruby developer. And I just so happen to work for a company called Ruby. Spelled this way, though. Uh, Ruby is an online cooking school, actually. So we do online culinary training. And we attempt to teach people how to cook, basically, so to provide better health and wellness for them for themselves. Outside of Ruby and Ruby, I am also a co-owner of a small motorcycle shop in southern Vermont, which is where I spend most of my time living. Uh, here's some bikes that we've built over the years. Um, outside of making custom bikes, the bread and butter of the shop is really just doing you know, tire changes, oil changes, that sort of thing. But this is the more fun stuff to do. Um, I do seat upholstery, and you know, I have a full-time job. The two guys that run it, my best friends for many years, work 80-hour weeks. Um, so I mostly show up on the weekends and pretend to look cool when I get the chance and talk about it at conferences. So, so what I want to talk about is something that drives me a little bit crazy all the time, and maybe for everyone too, is this idea of, you know, am I any, am I any good? And I guess we're in a church building, but I'm not mean morally good here. I mean, am I a good you know, Ruby developer? Or am I a good developer in theory at all? So often when I'm writing code, like this chap here, I find myself coding with someone sort of looking over my shoulder the whole time, right? I'm imagining there's some future developer. And at some point in the future, they're going to look at my code and judge my code. And that sort of keeps me up at night, right? Am I doing? Am I doing it right, you know? <laughs> Most of the time, they're probably judging me like this in my head anyway. So all of us come to conferences. We read blogs. We learn about what beautiful code is. And of course, we all attain to write beautiful code. But you know, how often does that happen? I mean, what's most interesting, I think, is that often this future developer who's going to end up judging my code may actually be myself most of the time. I mean, I think all of us have the experience where we look at some code we wrote six months ago or maybe a month ago, and you think, you know, well, who the hell wrote this code, right? Did I write this code? And was I drunk when I wrote that code? Or am I, am I drunk right now? But you know, here's Slack from my, my coworker, Chris, right? This wasn't that long ago, right? And he's thinking, why did I do that? So, it makes me ask this question all the time where if, you know, the, the past me and the present me and the future me can't even decide on what as good code is, then you know, how can we expect an entire community to come to agreement of what good code means? So let's go like this. So this talk is a little bit about that. It's about good code, let's say, versus bad code, or maybe we want to say good code versus bad code. And obviously, the title of the talk, Stolen Cleverly, from a, a good book, and I don't know if anyone has read this or has not read it, but not too long after I decided to try and write this talk, uh, Robert actually passed away. But still a great book, a lot of pearls of wisdom, and this talk is more maybe, let's say, about Zen than it is about motorcycles. But So like I said, I'm a Ruby developer. I work at this company called Ruby. And Ruby is a very small company. When I started there six years ago, which is forever, I guess, in our industry, uh, there was only 10 people, and only two of them were the dev team, and I was one of them. Over the years, the company now has grown to about 20 people. Uh, our dev team has gone up and down, and you know, it maxed out at four, and we're down to one, which is me. Now we're back up to three people. So for me, you know, three people is a is a big team. So here's my whole team, doing some team building over the summer. Adam's our CTO, and there's me in the middle, and then this guy. This is me uh, respecting his privacy here. This is Chris. So when I go to conferences or read blogs and listen to talks, usually I hear people say things like, 
oh, if you're on a team of, you know, small team of 30 people, you know, you should, uh, this will work great for you. Or if you're on a team of 20 people, you know, a really small team, yeah, you should use this type of coding. And I just found that sort of my realities of working in a really small team don't always line up with what I hear at, at talks and at conferences. And I'm often left wondering, you know, is what I'm doing bad? So, well, you know, we all sort of know what, what bad code is. Here's a, here's a list of a few things. Let's do this. Do this. So I, you know, I don't know, from missing tests to fat controllers, fat models, all the way down to, you know, I don't know what the opposite of dry code is, but let's call it wet code. But, you know, I've done all of these things. I probably did, I don't know, most of these things last week, or let's say half of them, you know. But, so if what I'm doing is the wrong thing to do, you know, I'm just wondering, like, what is the, what is the right thing to do in my situation? Or if my website is, functioning and the students that are using our product all over the world are, you know, enjoying it, you know, is what I'm doing still the wrong thing? Or, you know, at the end of the day, what does quality even mean, you know, and who gets to decide what quality code is? And I think that maybe most importantly, and this is the thing I think about the most, is if all of my students are happy, then is what I'm doing the wrong thing? So I think about this a lot, and I think we can think about anything especially code, we could put it on a code continuum here. So we've got a sliding scale, looks like this. You know, on one side, let's put good code over here, then obviously we're gonna put bad code over here. And I'm just gonna hazard a guess that most of us would say, hey, we wanna live over here, right? You know, I write good code most of the time. And so it makes me wanna square my feelings here with, you know, I feel like I'm a good developer, but maybe I'm doing some bad practices on occasion. But, you know, I mean, gosh darn it, my CEO likes me, so I must be doing something right. So I did what most of us do probably for most of our careers. I went to Google to see if anyone else had any thoughts on this type of thing. So if you go all the way back to 1989, you find a little post written on this guy's personal site. This is Richard Gabriel. It's called The Rise of worse is better, and I liked it already with the title. But um, Richard was a Lisp developer back in the day when C and Lisp were kind of battling for this dominance, you know, who was gonna win. And what was happening is that C was actually winning. So Richard was a Lisp developer, and he was trying to explain, you know, why was this happening? So he said, you know, there's two different types of coding styles, let's say. There's the MIT approach, sounds fancy. Then there's the New Jersey style, which I guess sounds not fancy. I don't know if anyone here is from New Jersey. I apologize on his behalf. But basically he was saying, you know, the MIT approach, that's the right way to code. And over here, the New Jersey style, it's actually, it's, it's worse, but it's this worse is better thing. So obviously we could, you know, hazard that we can imply a scale with these two things. But Richard's post is a little bit rambly and kind of hard to read, but let me read this quote directly from him. Let me get this thing off my finger. Oh, I can't find my mouse. Oh, I found it. Okay. This is what Richard said. He says, C is a programming language designed for writing Unix, and it was designed using the, Jer the New Jersey approach. C is therefore a language for which it is easy to write a decent compiler and it requires the programmer to write text that's easy for the computer to interpret. Both early Unix and C compilers had simple structures, are easy to port, require a few machine resources to run, and provide about 50 to 80% of what you want from an operating system and programming language. So half of the computers that exist at any point are worse than median, i.e. they're slower and smaller. Unix and C will work fine on them. The worse is better philosophy means that implementation simplicity has the highest priority which means Unix and C are easy to port on such machines. Therefore, one expects that if 50% functionality of Unix and C are satisfactory, then they'll start to appear everywhere. And they have, haven't they? So, you know, we all know what happened. Most of us are probably all on Macs here. I've seen a couple not. But, you know, Unix 1, Lisp, although I think, is anyone here, has anyone here programmed Lisp? That's way more hands than I expected. That's great. I have not ever looked at Lisp, but apparently Lisp is a much more technically superior language than C, and yet C sort of won out. So 
I love this quote from, from Jeff Atwood, who's a co-founder of Stack Overflow, where he says, simple solutions survive and prosper because they work and people can actually understand them. We should strive to build simple solutions whenever possible, even if we have to occasionally hold our noses when doing it. I just love this idea, and I obviously I didn't pay for this photo here, but this idea that even though we know something's wrong, it may actually turn out being what we want to do because it's going to be a more successful product. And I just think that's a really interesting way to think about coding. So, you know, this idea that there's a good way to do it and there's a bad way, where over here we're going to have some code, some language, some library, whatever it is, it's going to be technically superior to the thing on the other side. But on the other side, this thing might have a much more simple implementation. We were talking about that earlier. Adam was talking about that with gems and stuff, but <laughs> and talk about the elephant in the room, I guess, right? It's PHP. I think most of us, maybe, or plenty of us, some of us, started their careers in Ruby in another language. Oftentimes, it was was this guy. So I started off, you know, making websites for friends, like a lot of people did, and eventually someone uh, told me about WordPress. And then eventually, I luckily landed a job where they did Ruby. But you know, PHP is not the best language ever written, but it runs a lot of the world. And you know, back in the early 2000s, in 2001, the system came out called Movable Type, and it was, let's say, a competitor to WordPress. But WordPress didn't actually come out until 2003, so Movable Type beat them to the market. But one of the issues with Movable Type was it was actually written in Perl. Which is nice. Perl is a better language than PHP. But the problem was that being written in Perl, movable type was not particularly easy to get installed. You had to, you know, find a developer. You had to find someone that knew Perl, and you had to get them to set it up for you. So, even though they had a two-year head start, when WordPress came out in 2003, we all sort of know what happened. You know, I think it's something. It's hard to find exact figures, but something like 75% of the internet is on WordPress, which is crazy. And I mean, I'm glad we're all here at the Ruby conference and not. A WordPress conference, but we come back to this idea where if we take a sliding scale of these things, you know, you could say movable type probably lives on this side, right? It's technically superior, and yet over here we have WordPress with a superior user experience. We all know that the actual user experience of using WordPress for the folks that are going to use it once you've built them the site is really good, and that's what's really made WordPress so successful. So again, you know, on one side we've got good code, and do we have a good product? I mean, you know, if you build a good product, probably. But the thing is, it's interesting is that we're on this bad code side. It doesn't mean we're going to have a bad product, right? We can end up with a good product. So going back a little farther, even than '89 or the early 2000s, talk about gas versus electric, and this cable's not real long. So I don't want to talk about stoves. Actually, I want to talk about cars, so, and more specifically, motors. So in the early 1900s, as many folks maybe don't know, actually, there were probably there were an equal number of electric cars and gasoline cars. And electric cars suffered from the same things they suffer from these days, where you know the range was not very far and it was very expensive to get batteries. So they weren't the most optimal experience. But the the issue back then is that gasoline vehicles were terrible also. You know, they, they smelled bad. Uh, you had to hand crank them to start them, and people would break their arms trying to get their car started. And, you know, they had uh, complicated shifting mechanisms. No one had standardized pedals. Like, you know, trying to figure out how to operate a gas vehicle at that point, not very good. So the two sort of fought back and forth for a while. And then, uh, you know, in the early 1900s, in 1909, uh, Ford came out with the Model T, and what that did was slash the price all the way down to a quarter. So I guess this this thing here cost two grand, and the Model T when it came out was something like seven hundred dollars. So that was its first uh, way to beat these cars was just on price. But then in the the mid nineteen teens, they came out with the electric starter, and basically the gas car was on its way. And so. This type of thing makes me wonder. I mean, here's a schematic of, you know, a Ferrari motor. So maybe this is has slight, slightly more uh, pieces than normal. But but motors have thousands of parts in them. You know, it's not a really well-designed system. And my question is, you know, is this bad?
code. I mean, I don't know how many people even know all the pieces of a motor, how a motor works, you know, and this isn't including the transmission or the cooling system and all the other things that go along with having a gas motor. And what's crazy is you look at this motorcycle here, this one was built in 1920, and you know, here's one from 2017, and you know, obviously there's been some upgrades stylistically, but all of the same pieces are still there, and it's 100 years later, you know, there hasn't been much change. Basically, this is legacy code, man. This is serious legacy code. There's been a lot of improvements over the years, but this actual code base has never been replaced. And if you take a look at an electric motor, you know, here's a random schematic I found. I don't know, you know, I don't want to count them, but there's like 20 or less parts. If you take a Tesla motor apart, it looks just like this. Electric motors, they don't require transmissions, you don't have to shift, there's all those good things. So, you know, really they're that much better. But in the end of the day, what happened, right? It's the same type of thing where this sort of superior user experience led to gasoline cars being more dominant, even though I would argue uh, that the complexity of the motors is not a better design. So all of this makes me ask myself, sort of like a tree falling in the woods. You know, if your product is built on on bad code, but your users don't know, like at the end of the day, does it really matter? I'm waiting for like gasps, oh, does it matter? You know, and I'm not trying to say no, it doesn't, but I'm just saying the answer probably lies somewhere in here, right? Somewhere in the scale. It probably depends on what you're building. And like all of these things, I think it's really interesting where it's sort of taking this black box idea. You know, you've got this black box and you have some input and you go, what's, I wonder what's in there, but you know what? It probably, for a lot of things, it doesn't really matter. It's like you take a, a car, I think it's the literal example of a black box. You know, the complexities of a motor are totally abstracted away under the hood, and the user of the vehicle doesn't have to know anything about how a car works to understand how to operate a car. So, it le it's led me to my theory here that I'm still sort of working on the title, but I did, I did copyrighted for now, but if there's any vegetarians, actually I'm one, so just for you, I have this. But, you know, so sort of like a sausage factory, and here's, uh, you know, if you don't know what they look like on the inside, here's some here, and there's some more hot dogs here, and, well, it's actually a pretzel factory, I just thought. <laughs> look at that thing, it's amazing. So, you know, basically we've got something going on the, the input here, let's say, vegetables for your veggie dogs and the output you get a hot dog and you almost don't even want to know what's happening in the middle. So, you know, how does this apply to, to Ruby code? So this is going to be the, the couple technical slides in this entire presentation. But, so hopefully you can sort of see that. But it doesn't matter if you can't. Up here we've got a user's controller and then we've got a create method. So probably everyone has one of these and probably every one of your apps. And, you know, this is sort of a pretty thick you know, let's say there's a lot of more stuff hiding down here too, but you know, we're creating a user, we're gonna give them some token, and then after we save it, we wanna, you know, make sure we create their account, and then maybe save some preferences, and now oh, we've got a bunch of, you know, public email lists, we need to, to get them all into, and you know, there's a whole bunch of gross looking stuff sort of sitting in our controller, and we, we know, we wanna write beautiful code, so we can't leave that in there. So well, I maybe think the first thing you're gonna do is, well, let's just make some private methods, and shove everything down here, and actually, you know, cleaned it up pretty good, I might call that pretty good, but. You know, what we've become kind of obsessed with at Ruby, the company I work for, is making service objects to sort of abstract away all this ugly code. So what we can actually do is turn this user's controller into something really simple here, right? We're just gonna make this one, well, let's say two lines of, of logic here. It just takes in the normal user params and then We'll do some call methods. So what does our user sign up look like? Well here, you know, it's just a basic old Ruby object where we're gonna take all those private methods we had in our controller and just shove them into the call method and then, you know, this would be down here somewhere. But what's so nice about this is you, you take something that looks like this, you turn it into something like this and, you know, basically you've got a really clean API hiding all this gross stuff underneath that maybe you wanna think about some other day or maybe never again, I don't know. So, sorry, big picture of Joel there. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, like, what, what, do you, what do you call this kind of programming? So this guy, Joel, he's one of the uh, 
uh, co-founders of Trello, and he is, I guess, currently the CEO of Stack Overflow, everyone's favorite website. So he wrote an article in 2009 on his own blog, and it was called The Duct Tape Programmer. And this is how he described a duct tape programmer. He said, a duct tape programmer is the kind of programmer who is hard at work building the future and making useful things so that people can do stuff. They're the person you want on your team building go-karts because they have two favorite tools, duct tape and WD-40. And they will wield them elegantly, even as your go-kart is careening down the hill at a mile a minute. This will happen while other programmers are still at the starting line arguing over whether to use titanium or some other kind of space-age composite material that Boeing will use in the next 787 Dreamliner. When you're done, you might have a messy go-kart, but it'll sure as hell fly. When I read this like four years ago, like literally it changed my outlook on who I was as a developer and it made me realize that, you know, the way I was coding maybe has applications in different places like a small company. And I really like this quote from Jamie who was working on Netscape when Netscape was trying to exist from back in the end of the 90s. But he says, you know, it's great to rewrite your code and make it cleaner, and by the third time, it'll actually be pretty. But that's not the point. You're not here to write code. You're here to ship products. If there's no unit test, the customer isn't going to complain about that. And let me, you know, be honest, in a room full of Ruby developers, and I think, you know, if it was a room of PHP developers, no one would probably care, but I haven't written that many tests in my life. I've worked on the same application for six years. It's been an application for almost 10 years. It has not that many tests, you know, but we are helping people in, you know, 150 countries all over the world learn to cook better. So I think as a successful product, we're doing pretty good. Could we use some more tests? Yeah, we totally could, but we don't have them. So what Joel says in his article says, you know, shipping is a feature. It's a really important feature, and basically, your product must have it. So obviously not everyone agrees with Joel. I actually don't know who this guy is, but this is sort of his response. But what this just leads us to, right, is there's a fundamental difference of opinion between people. So if we're going to take our sliding scale and we're going to say, well, you know, maybe it's not good and, and bad, but what are we going to put on these sides here? So I found this Google Plus article article, I don't know what Google Plus is, Google Plus post, written by Steve, um, let's say, Yege, I don't know, Yeg. Um, he's kind of mildly famous, I think, for accidentally posting a Google Plus that was supposed to be private, talking a lot of shit about Google, uh, and making it public to everyone by accident. But this one was supposed to be public. And this sort of also helped really solidify this idea for me, is that instead of putting good on one side and bad on the other side, you know, we, we have a scale, but the sides of the scales are actually more like this, right? And on one side, we're going to have conservative folks. On the other side, we're going to have liberal folks. So, you know, we're not talking politics, and I don't think it's true, probably, that for most people, if you're a conservative politically, you're going to be a conservative developer and vice versa. So don't worry about that right off the bat. But I think similar to politics, the issue is that both sides know that what they're doing is the right way to do it. So if we were going to describe maybe each of these styles, let's sort of describe it from the conservative side and then how the liberal side would react to that. So conservatives would probably say something like, you know, eval is not a good thing to have in your application. You know, meta, Ruby is great, right? We can do metaprogramming, but metaprogramming is actually kind of dangerous, you know? Like, be careful with that. Also, when you do things like eval and it makes it hard to read your code, and future developers are going to have a hard time figuring out what's going on in your app. But I think a liberal developer might say, yeah, you know, programmers learn pretty quickly. I think especially when your job is on the line. So, you know, we'll probably learn that. We can figure it out. Eval, you can do interesting things. So let's not just say, you know, let's not use it. Conservative programmer may say, you know, DSL, also bad. I think, again, we're extra lucky. Ruby makes writing DSL really easy, so maybe we're lucky or not lucky, depending on your perspective. But DSL, you can do interesting things with. And even though it might be hard to figure out and you may have to ooh, have some comments in your code, which people may be against, uh, you know, programmers will probably figure it out. 
strict coding style guides. So do, do any of you have these at your work, or workplace, a few people? And if, what happens if you, I like the, yeah, sort of, yeah, that's sort of what we have, yeah, I don't know. Uh, did it get through the pull request? I guess it's in the guide now. Um, you know, I think the sort of thing where having a rigid rule, well, maybe, maybe it limits your flexibility and it slows down what you're doing. And same thing with having strict data structures in your database. I remember when I was early on in my career, I asked my boss, I was like, hey, I've got an, got an array. I really want to save it. Do you think I should use a string or text in the database? And I, I learned that, oh, you're apparently not supposed to do that. Although these days I'd say, well, I'd probably go with text. But anyway, you know, anything rigid here is like, you know, maybe it has a use case and let's not rule it out from the beginning. Conservative developer might say, hey, you know, code should be optimized. Speed, that's very important. Having code that's optimized is very important. And a liberal developer might say, well, I think this is, a, this is supposed to be a, a rule, right, that premature optimization is terrible. A conservative programmer might say, production code must always be safety checked. And a liberal developer maybe would say, hey, you know, Testing is needed only where absolutely necessary. I'd say something like your checkout processor, right? We're taking people's money. Like, that's a great place to have tests. Conservative developer may say, hey, if there's any safety doubts, we definitely can't allow that in a production app. And then, you know, a liberal might say, well, why don't we try taking some risks? Let's embrace progress. And I like Steve used this word, which I'd never actually heard before, but let's resist ossification, which actually means the hardening of the bone, which is kind of a cool word. So let's, you know, let's not be rigid. A conservative developer may say, software should always aim to be bug-free before launch. And I think all of us would say, yeah, we should aim to be bug-free, no matter where you sit on the line. But and I think this is sort of maybe the most important differentiator, is that a liberal developer would say, you know what, we're always going to have bugs in our code. And let's Let's worry about them, but maybe let's worry about them when we get to them or when they become an issue. You know, bugs, they're not the biggest deal. So it sort of comes down to this main differentiator between, let's say, safety. I don't really know what the best word to choose over here is, but let's go with something like agility. And again, like politics, I don't think these both sides have opinions of each other. And a, a conservative developer would probably say, well, liberals are pretty negligent, careless. And, you know, maybe naive even with the safety stuff. And a, a liberal developer might say that conservatives, well, they're kind of paranoid, they're dogmatic, and, and they're uptight. So we come back to our code continuum here. So if on this side we've got, you know, the right thing to do, and on this side we've, we have the wrong thing to do, I guess it seems like for myself maybe I just want to be asking the question, I've been asking the wrong question, the whole time. And I really like this quote from the pragmatic programmer. It says, you know, there's no easy answers and there is no such thing as the best solution, be it a tool, a language, or an operating system. There can only be systems that are more appropriate in a particular set of circumstances. So I think, you know, let's think about circumstances where one or the other may be more important. If you're going to work at NASA and you're going to send rockets to wherever, hopefully Mars, um, you know, you probably want someone maybe over here, you know, or maybe, maybe even over here. You know, <laughs> should be pretty sure about that. But, you know, if you're going to develop the first AI bread scanning image <laughs> recognition, this is a real thing. You know, I mean, that, you know, maybe over here. You should probably get that thing to market and make sure someone wants it before you spend too much time maybe on your unit tests, you know? So I think what this really comes down to is that you know, the right way to do any coding is always the right way that works for your team, that works for you. But you know, what really works for your product? And I think what's interesting is I work on a team of only three people. And I'd say we have an, the entire spread where uh, maybe I'm the most liberal and I have a conservative colleague. And, Pull requests are, are always fun, but you know, I think at the end of the day, I've become a better developer. He's probably become a better developer too. So it's interesting because Steve mentions in his article, he says that teams shouldn't be mixed. But you know, I think being in an echo chamber, whether it's politically or you know, codically, I think it's good to mix it up. So at the end of the day, right, this issue of 
of quality. You know, it's not that, that it's on one end or the other. It's that you can come out with quality products with both these coding styles. And you know, like any sliding scale, probably, you know, you could live on one side or the other or maybe somewhere in the middle. So I was gonna come up with some rules, but I guess if I'm gonna claim I'm, I'm rigid, I'm a non-rigid liberal developer, then let's, let's call them guidelines. So I think the first and most important one maybe to allay any conservatives, you know, is I'm not saying be lazy, right? Don't be lazy, you know, let's not do that, right? Come on. I'm saying let's do good work, right? But know, know the difference. I'm saying, you know, refactoring and rewriting is great, but if you have time to do it, if you don't have time to do it, I would say don't agonize over it. And this whole thing about rewriting code too, I think you gotta remember the, the past you, the future you, and the, and the present you. There's no, there's no, who knows if you rewrite something today because you think it's gonna totally blow away what you did last year, that the future you may wanna rewrite it just again. I think precision is great, and I think everyone should aim to do their best work. But I think that always knowing that you're there to ship something to an end user for them to use is really important to, to keep in your head. And I think, you know, like all of us do, we're all here at a conference trying to learn new things, right? The best we can do is keep learning. Again, the future you is gonna know a lot more than the present you, and it's probably gonna, they are probably gonna judge you on your code. And I think, lastly, you know, make sure you're having fun. If you're not having fun, then you're definitely doing something wrong. And it may be you're on a team full of liberals and you're a conservative. If that's true, you know, then maybe that's not the best team for you. But I think no matter what style you find works for you, find a company that embraces that and that also works for you. I'm gonna see if I can make this, Let's see if this plays. Oh, oh, that really, oh, it's actually doing something. I can't find my mouse. Is it, I'm gonna find, find the style that makes you feel like this. <laughs> I just saw this last night and I was like, this encapsulates me at work perfectly. Look at that. I don't even know if I can get back to my presentation now. Well, it doesn't matter. So I think this question of, you know, am I any good is the wrong question to ask. Basically, I think probably, all, again, all of us here, we work at companies that pay us money. I think if you get paid to program, then, you know, you made it. You know, you're a real programmer and you're probably good and you're learning to be better. And I think more importantly, if someone has paid you to use a product that you've built, you know, you're a good developer and you made it. And I think maybe the last quote that I wish was up there, but I think at the end of the day what it comes down to is that you don't have to be a rock star developer to build a rock star product. And that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>